and never, never really fail God in any way. You know, some some people we look at and we want them to be our heroes in the faith, and then just through some circumstance or some mistake they make, they, they begin to <coughs> fall and wane. I, I've always said I want to make all my heroes dead ones, that way they can't mess up. <laughs> but Billy Graham was somebody you could make a hero, and you knew he was going to be consistently there. So uh, let's, let's take a second and just thank the Lord that we were alive uh, during his lifetime, and uh, he visited in every one of our homes, didn't he? I remember seeing him first in black and white and thinking, wow, that's powerful. And I didn't know what powerful was. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us, caring for us, and giving us Billy Graham. And God, I know he, among all of us, would be the first one to say, don't worship me, but worship the Savior. Look to him. So many times he said, I will not get to heaven based on crusades or results of what it is that I do in my work, I will get to heaven because I have trusted Christ. Father, he knew what it meant to serve you, and he did it with such great integrity, and it's a, just an honor to be in a generation that got to sit back and watch and even participate. So, Father, we thank you for his life. I pray, Lord, for their family and for this week, and the greatest thing that could happen is... Uh, that during his funeral we would truly see a revival break loose in America. That was his, uh, his heart wish. He used to say it from every pulpit, wherever he was, he would say, America needs a Holy Ghost revival. And so, Father, if his death can usher that in, we praise you and we thank you. We love you for the time that, that you've given us the opportunity to see Billy Graham. And so, Father, we know he has already heard the great words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And Lord, we thank you for him in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm uh, beginning a new series today, and, you know, it's kind of the antithesis of where we've been. We've been in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and, uh, and those, were, those were a little tougher uh, than, than what I would take notes or... Put your pencils away and go to sleep. I don't care. Uh, my responsibility is just to deliver the truth to you uh, as I know it. In, uh, in Psalms 1611, it says, You show me the way of life, granted me the joy of your presence, and the pleasure of living with you forever. So in the Old Testament, in, in Psalms, we see the introduction of the fact that God wants us to have great joy. When I, I start thinking about joy and joy in our world, there's not much of it, is there? We live in kind of a desperate, awful, uh, you know, just, just a world that, that can't find anything good, and, and our world is negative in its approach, and we walk around with long faces and heavy hearts, and, and why wouldn't we? Have you watched the news? As a matter of fact, the news is so negative, when it's not negative enough, we'll turn to another news to see if they got something more negative than that news has. And, and, and much of the news, even, even though it's negative, you turn to some of it, it's not just only negative, it's not even right. And so we look at all that, and that's our world, and that's what we get fed, and every night we read negative newspapers, we watch negative news. I mean, even the weather, oh my gosh. It's never, it's, it, it's always partly cloudy, right? Have you ever heard a weatherman come on and say, it's going to be mostly clear. You're going to have a beautiful day. I mean, if you just listen to the weather guys, if it's, if it's beautiful outside, they're telling you about when it's not going to be beautiful, right? They're saying, well, it's good out there today, but tomorrow, here's what's going to happen. And you know, they got the, they got the big weather trucks that are going to go out. And, and they got all those they got all those warning weather signs, and you get apps to tell you when there's going to be tornadoes. And I, I, tornadoes just scare me to death. I, I grew up in Southern California. Give me a good earthquake anytime. <laughs> I mean, that's a little shake, rock and roll, and it's over. A few things break, and you're done. But a tornado, that thing's moving around. So they got trucks to chase them around. They got all these things that they got, and and they never look at anything in a positive manner. You ever see a weather guy when we have bad weather and your program goes off? 
and we get to see the red and the purple in some areas you don't even care about? Does that bother anybody else? That drives me nuts. I'm watching something, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at Waxahachie. Well, I, you know, uh, forgive me, but if you live in Waxahachie, I don't care if you're under a tornado watch. I was watching my program. <laughs> Now, if it's McKinney, I want to know. Yeah. But other than that, you know, leave me alone. But they get all excited, they get all worked up, and it's, it's negative. And all, all of life seems to be like that. Um, I had the privilege of knowing Zig Ziglar really well. And uh, I was giving him a ride one time. And, uh, and I said, you know where we're going? And Zig said, yes. And I said, okay, good. He said, you're going to make a right turn up here at that green light. I said, you mean the red light? He goes, no, the green light. It's as green as often as it is red. <laughs> yes, don't be so negative. <laughs> and uh, his daughter, Cindy, one time was telling me, she said, at my house, you couldn't even catch a cold. She said, if you caught a cold, he, he would look at you and say, well, you got a warm, my baby doll. <laughs> He said, just touch of yourself, you're warm. And, and he said that uh, you never got the heel of the, of the uh, bread. If you got to the heel, uh, he said, uh, let's celebrate. We're going to have a new loaf. <laughs> and that's what made him so endearing. There was a positive stuff, you know. He understood that the great secret that we carry around, the gigantic secret the Christians have and we keep it to ourselves is what? Joy. Joy. We ought to be the happiest people there are. And when we're not, something is desperately wrong with our heart. And so I'm going to take us to a book where that's all it's about is joy. I was going through the, the, the Golden Chick and, and I never go through the Golden Chick but they got really good tea. And so I go through and I, I start my order and uh, and I'm telling the guy, I just want tea. And he's saying, okay. He said, well, you want that sweet or not sweet? And I said, half and half. And so he said, he said, okay, we can do that. He said, Jesus loves you. And I thought, what? So I drove up. And I was greeted by this, uh, this tall, handsome, young black guy. He's just standing there and got a big smile on his face. He said, I fixed your tea. And he handed me tea. He says, he said, uh, he said, enjoy that in Jesus' name. You know, the Bible says a cup of water in Jesus' name will come back. And, and I said, uh, obviously, young man, you're a believer. And he said, yes, sir. And I said, uh, are they okay with that here? He says, I have no idea. <laughs> he said, I've only been here a week, and I'll be here till Jesus wants me somewhere else. <laughs> And I said, well, uh, God love you. And, I, you know, I prayed with him and we went on. But he, he was such a, such a joyful guy. And I thought, gosh, where did that go? Where did that go? When did, when did, I, did I ever have that much joy? Was I ever that excited about who God is in my life? And that's a great question. You know, how will you be remembered? How are you going to be remembered? Are you going to be remembered as grumpy? I mean, you know, there are people who, like their personalities, even though they might be joyful at some times, you know, get to a holiday or something and they get grumpy, low. And, you know, are you going to be remembered? At, are you going to leave laughter with your family? Or just discouragement? Yeah, you know how easy it is to discourage people? It's real easy. That's a simple thing to do. And, and some of us are so good at it. And you can tell by the people that are around you, they, they, they look discouraged. You know, you can have love. You can have the love of God. You can have great knowledge about God. You could be a person who's filled with enormous compassion, but joy. Joy is like a magnet that will draw people to you. It's like a magnet that will ask people to, you just draw people in and they will be asking you, where does that joy come from? Hopefully through this book, we will, we will decide to move away from discouragement. Have, have you been watching the, uh, the Olympics? If you don't think you're good at discouragement, 
sit there on the couch and listen to yourself as the Olympians go out there and try to do what they do. Like I become like the judge from Russia or something. You know what I mean? They, they come out and they're, they're on that ice and they're skating around and they, they jump up and, and I say, oh, see, now he didn't bend his leg at all when he went up for that triple X. And he landed on, and that, they're, they're gonna, he's gonna lose a whole point. You know, and I'm being discouraging and I'm thinking if they could hear me, they would come over and go, it's slippery out here. <laughs> Have you ever done this? You know, or, or I'm watching the half pipe, you know, and the guy gets up there and he's spinning around 18 feet above the, the you know, the tube that he's in. And, and that puts him, you know, way up in the air. And he's flipping around, but he doesn't quite get a hold of his, uh, of his ski. And I, I'm like, see, that's not going to win him a gold. And I start getting real critical again. I mean, the Olympics is a good time. I tell you, my best thing to watch, though, was the curling thing. John called me and asked me, did you see the curling? And that's my kind of sport. Five fat white guys. In their middle age, with a broom. Huh? I'm thinking there's still, there's still something out there for me. I just have to go learn how to do it. I, I think I can do it. You just kind of shove the thing and then get in front of it with a broom. How hard is that? Well, they were pretty excited. And it was pretty exciting to watch them. But uh, normally, uh, it's left to the young, isn't it? And, uh, and so it's been fun to watch. And it's been fun to watch even kind of the manufactured joy that they show. And I say manufactured joy. Their, their whole lives are wrapped up in their athletic ability. And, and that does show a sense of joy in Proverbs. It says, joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. In Proverbs 17, 22. You know, it's always, Proverbs is always done in a contrast. It'll usually give you the bad news and then the good news. Or the good news and then the bad news. Here it says, a joyful heart is like a good medicine. And that is scientifically true. If you will but laugh, if you will just have joy in your life, if you will understand one of the secrets of God is that by knowing Him, you can be joyful throughout life. Whatever life throws at you doesn't matter. You have this great sense of joy. One of the things that carried Billy Graham throughout his, throughout his life was not a deep, dark need to share the gospel, but the joy of the Lord that was in him that, that made him be able to do what it is he did. You see, God wants us to be joyful. He wants us to be healthy. And he wants us to understand that, uh, that there is so much for us. The key verse in Philippians that we're going to see is this one. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is the, the verse that, uh, that is the, the key verse in the whole book is, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I bet you didn't even know that Paul said that in Philippians. But that's where he said it. And he said it to this, to this church that was a joyful church for him. I, I've taken another, uh, I got another rendition of it from the remedy uh, paraphrase. It says, for me, the only purpose in living is to promote the truth about God as, as revealed in Christ. But I know that when I die, my earthly struggles will be over and I will gain all that I have sought in Christ. That's a great explanation of what that verse means. See, in this wonderful book, what we're going to find is that Christ is the object, but joy is the subject. So throughout the book, you'll see that. The book was written in A.D. 62, and the tone of the book is warm and encouraging and affirming. Nothing like where we've been in First and Second Corinthians. And the interesting thing about that is he sounds like when you first read it, you would think, well, where is Paul when he's writing this letter? He sounds like he, you know, he, might, be, uh, he might be in the Bahamas just bagging some rays and having one of those drinks with an umbrella in it, just kind of laid back, having a good time. He's in prison. He's in prison in Rome. Matter of fact, he's in prison for the 12th time. But they got so tired of sticking him in prison, and they, they really couldn't afford to put him in prison. Last time they put him in prison, 
uh, you know, uh, all the walls fell down and, and uh, you know, a lot of guys walked out and he stayed and continued to share the gospel. So what they did with him is they brought him really close to where the Caesar was. And he was in a house and he was under literally house arrest. And every day they would bring a, a, court, a, court, a Roman guard over to him and they would chain him to the Roman guard. And so what was happening was he would share the gospel and these Roman guards were getting saved. And as they were getting saved, they would go back into the palace of Caesar and they'd begin to share the gospel in there. And, uh, and, and they tell us now that several people had accepted Christ and it had infiltrated the very peak of, of uh, that, that particular world during that time. It had gone all the way to Caesar's palace. Not the one in Vegas, the one in Rome. <laughs> It still hasn't reached Caesar's Palace in Vegas. Uh, there are some real uniquenesses to this book. Uh, here they are. No major problem passages. So there's nothing to, you know, you've got to get the eggheads involved and read a bunch of commentaries about it. There's none of that. There's, there's nothing in there that's a problem passage. Everybody agrees. What it says is what it says. The second thing is, Joy is found in each chapter. There's not a chapter that doesn't talk about joy. And there's not one quote from the Old Testament. No other book in the New Testament does that. There's not one quote at all from the Old Testament. And Christ is mentioned over 40 times. And it is the most positive of not just all of Paul's letters, the most positive of any book that you will find in the Bible. And it is basically a love letter. A love letter. Um, do you miss getting letters? Some of you are not old enough to know the old days, but like in the old days, you would sit down and you'd write somebody a letter, somebody you cared about. And when you got that letter, the first thing you would do, if it's multiple pages, is what? You'd rush back to the back page and you'd find the name. Unless it was from my grandmother and I could tell from the writing it was hers. She should have been a doctor. You couldn't read a thing. But it was a letter. And you hung on to those letters for long periods of time. I have a, I have a book up in my library, and, it, and it's, it's got a letter in there. A letter that's very important to me. And I put another one in there, and it was a letter from my dad. Uh, but it was one from me to my dad. And you keep letters. We don't do letters anymore. Remember... Uh, Remember Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan? They wrote love letters to one another. And those got published, and that was a big deal. I wonder what Trump's going to look like, you know? <laughs> 16 figures in a tweet, you know? I mean, uh, what are those, those going to look like? And, they, and those just get erased. I mean, now we talk to each other, and we, we communicate with each other through our hands, and using our mind, it's an email or a text. And what do you do with an email or a text? You delete it. You read it, you go, that's nice, boom. But what happens when somebody sits down and writes you a letter? Remember that old song, I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter, make believe it came from you? <laughs> the idea of getting a letter, I remember um, my parents' uh, best friend, his name was Duke Ellington, and Duke believed in blooming where he's planted. And he was a he was a painter, and he was a very popular painter. I don't mean house painter; he painted portraits and things. And uh, I remember the last time I saw him, uh, I was so excited to get to see him again. I hadn't seen him in years. And if if you come to our house, you can see some of his stuff. Like uh, he sent me an etching of John the Baptist because he did a great big uh, mural in a, a church in Pasadena. And he started it when I was 10. And he finished it when I was 30. And so when he finished, he sent me the sketch. They're like, the painters are laughing down front because they have paintings that they've been waiting 30 years to finish. Too. Yeah, the mural in the nursery will be done in 30 years. Children will, uh, will be much older. But the, the idea, the, the idea is, I was, I was sitting with him and uh, just excited to see him again. And he looked at me and, and he said, uh, 
I want you to, he said, I'm, I'm going to write you a letter. And I said, man, that'd be great. And he said, well, you got to write me one back. And I don't mean an email. I mean a letter. And I said, that'd be great. That was the last time I saw him. He never got the letter off, so I never got to write him back. I should have taken the initiative. There, there's, there's probably a letter that you need to write. And when you write it, here's a good idea. You might want to follow uh, the, the whole idea of what Paul does. He, uh, matter of fact, open up Philippians and go to four, chapter 4 of Philippians. We're going to take a 30,000 foot look at the book. By the way, it's such a great book. You can read this thing in about 30 minutes. You can sit in the house, open it up, you can read it. It's a, it's a book that you can memorize. Uh, I, I've had the privilege of studying this book in seminary under Dr. McGornman. And he was a great, great uh, seminary uh, professor. And I asked him one time, where did his love for Philippians come from? And he said, from its encouragement and its love for me. You know, he had 11 children, uh, 10 of them launched into ministry, one prodigal had died. And he said, without the encouragement and the joy from Philippians, he said, I don't know that I'd have been able to go on. So you see, it's a great book. I also had a knee surgeon uh, when we were, we were over in Bedford and Euless, and his name was Dr. Yamamoto, and his daughter was turning 16. And she came to him and she said, Daddy, I, I want a Jeep when I turn 16. And he said, no, I'm not going to buy you a Jeep. And she said, well, I, that's what I want. I don't want anything else. And he said, no, I, you're not going to buy you a Jeep. And so finally she said, what if I memorized Philippians? Would you buy me a Jeep? And he said, yeah, if you memorize Philippians, I'd buy you a Jeep. Two weeks later, she came into his office and she said, Daddy, I've got it memorized. And he opened up Philippians, and she started and went all the way through. And so the little girl had a cute little Jeep. Kind of, <laughs> it was all pinked up. And, and she got what she wanted because, because of that. Here's what Paul does in this letter. The first reason he writes it is he thanks them. He thanks them. And in chapter 4, verses 14 uh, through 17, we see this. It says, "Even so, I have done well to share. You have done well to share with me in my present difficulties." By the way, people are all going to be uh, are all going to suffer. There's nobody that's immune to suffering, and it's how you handle the suffering that shows how much of the Lord has gotten into you. And when you look at difficult things that happen to people, and you watch them go through it, it really makes greatness. There were some difficult things that happened to Billy Graham. And yet, those aren't the things he talks about. He talks about the Lord Christ. He talks about Jesus throughout. Because difficulties, uh, they really build the character of the person. They, they make you who you are. Here's Paul in prison. And he's saying, thank you, even in my present difficulty. He goes on, he says, as you know, you, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on to Macedonia. And no other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help more than once. Uh, I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Uh, rather, I want you to uh, receive a reward for your kindness. And the reward was just, just a thank you. Just a, a wonderful blessed thank you. You were the first to help me. This Philippian church is, is really his first venture into what we now know as Europe. And as he was on the way, he didn't ask. He never asked. And, and without asking, they sent him on his way with provision. And then, then they, they thought about him again, and they sent more provision. The whole idea is that he is just wanting to thank them because they were obedient to what God had told them to do. And that's the first reason. The second reason is over in chapter 3, verse 2. In chapter 3, verse 2, he's going to warn them. 
And he's going to say, watch out for the dogs, those people who do evil, those uh, manipulators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. <coughs> now, he's directly talking about that same crowd that had taken away the gospel from 1 Corinthians, or from, Corinthian, from the Corinthian church. Those dogs, those guys who were coming in with a mixture of Judaism and Christianity, and they're pulling you away and giving you a false gospel, and he calls them dogs, and he says, watch out for the dogs. So he thanks them, he warns them, and then uh, the final thing that he's doing is he's encouraging them. Turn to chapter 1, verse 27. He says, above all, above all, you must live as, as, uh, as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or, or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. So he's written them for those three purposes, and he accomplishes those, pers those, those three purposes. Now... The book is very simple. As a matter of fact, it's divided in four simple sections. Uh, and these are the sections. Uh, there is joy in living. And throughout chapter 1, as we dig through chapter 1, what you're going to see is he's going to talk about the joy of just being alive. The, the joy of living. And then the second chapter and the second, uh, the second section is the section in, there's joy in serving. And he will talk a lot about service and tell us uh, how we are to serve and, and the direction we are to go and what we're to be like in our service. And then uh, chapter 3 and the third section will be joy in sharing, sharing the gospel, sharing in, sharing in finances and sharing in encouragement and all of that. And then the fourth section will be joy in resting. What a great section to read. Do we need God's rest? I mean, we are the most unrested people for God's peace. That is the greatest need of human beings today, is to have the peace of God, just enough of it to rest. Most of us lay down, and the world just won't stop. Do you have that problem? You lay down, you know it's time to sleep, you want to sleep, but what happens? Your brain just gets filled with all the other things of the day. But when you have joy in living and joy in serving, joy in sharing you finally have joy in resting. Uh, so we want to for sure do that. So uh, what, he's, what, he's, what he's going to teach us is that you need to have a right focus. I was thinking about a right focus. And all through the book, he's going to talk about being in the moment and the importance of that. And uh, the, the thing that I think about when I think about that is this little thing written by Helen Malakote. Let me just show it to you. Helen Malicote wrote this. I was regretting the past and, and fearing the future, and suddenly my Lord was speaking. My name is I Am. He paused. I waited. He continued. When you live in the past with its mistakes and regrets, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not I was. When when you, when, you live, uh, when you live in the future with its problems, its fears, it's hard, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not I will be. When you live in this moment, it is not hard. I am there. My name is I am. We need to be current in everything we do. We need to understand that God wants us in this moment. This is the moment that God has given us. So let me, let me as, as we wrap up, I'm going to give you some things out of, out of these things to remember. And there's, there's really four. When you talk about, when you talk about joy, in, uh, joy in living, um, one of the main verses important verses in chapter 1 is this one. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that 
what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. I want you to know that being in prison is absolutely the best thing that could have ever happened for the gospel of Christ. How many of you could say that? If you were arrested today for no reason and you were put in prison, could you say, this is for the furtherance of the gospel? He would later say in that chapter, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he's giving us the secret of joy. The secret of joy is Christ. If you can put any, if any, anything else in that verse of scripture, if you were writing it and you had to say, for me to live is what? For me to live is my job. For me to live is, is my family. For me to live is this person. For me to live is this thing I do then you will never understand the true nature of joy. He's saying for me to live is Christ. As long as I'm alive, I can share Christ. I can talk about him. I can love him. He can love me back. Where would he get such a radical thought? So, living, living, uh, living joy, if I'm going to live joy, I need the best model I can possibly find. The most pristine model I can possibly find. And Paul gives it to us when he says, it's Christ. My model is Christ. For me to live is Christ. That's my model. That's who I follow. That's, that's, my, that's my behavior pattern. A pattern of service, a pattern of love, a pattern of joy. The second thing I want you to remember is that uh, there is joy in serving. And those verses come out of the second chapter. It says, Let each one of you look not only on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. Verses 4 and 5. Then he goes on in, in, uh, in verse 8 and says, And being found in, in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death under the cross. If I'm going to live a life that is serving the way that God wants me to serve, I need the right attitude. Service is about attitude. You know, it used to be when you were looking for an employee, the main thing you wanted to look for is expertise and, and skill and, and all kinds of different things. But you know what they look for today? The number one thing, talk to any HR person anywhere, they will tell you it's, the ability to work hard and the right attitude. Because nothing can ruin a business quicker than a wrong attitude. Nothing sours a church and kills its witness quicker than a wrong attitude. A sour, a, a disjointed kind of attitude. And so, so he's saying, he is saying that, uh, that Jesus himself being found human, this is Jesus, this is the Christ, this is the the, the God, part of the Godhead, part of the Trinity. And he left heaven. He didn't leave heaven grumbling. God didn't say, okay, son, it is time for you to go. It's time for you to head down there to a people who will not hear you, who won't listen to you, who will sin against you and the Father and, and the Holy Spirit, and yet you will go and you will live an entire life down there, and then you will die. And you will die the worst kind of way anybody could possibly die, death on a cross. But Jesus left heaven with a smile. And he came to earth with a smile. He came to earth with great joy. And he spread great joy. Wherever he would go, he would talk about the joy that God has for every one of us. As a matter of fact, flip over to John 15, 11. Because I, I think I think this is the this is the theme of of the entire book of, of Philippians really can come out of 1511. This is Jesus speaking. And he's just talked about the true vine. And he says, I have told you these things. So that you might be, so that you will be filled with my joy. The Lord.
Lord Jesus Christ and joy are synonymous with one another. Here's Jesus. Didn't, 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 feel, didn't feel angry or frustrated to be found in human form. He humbled himself to come to earth and to die. All he asks us to do is serve out of his love. Then there's joy in sharing. Uh, if, if I'm going to be a sharer, I need to have an eternal goal. I need to have something in mind. I need to sit down and think for a minute, what, what, what is my goal? Uh, and, and here's what he says. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider uh, that I have made it on my own. The one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's in chapter 3, 13 and 14. He had a goal in mind. His goal was to live his life in such a way that he, that he would win that goal. We've watched great athletes for the last two weeks have a goal. And when you set a goal, you're more likely to hit it. You've heard that, haven't you? If you make no goals, you'll, you'll, you'll make no sense in what it is you're doing. And when you set goals, you have a much greater chance of hitting them. And, and you, you hear what they said and how they worked, and most often they would say it's a team. And, and we're like a team when it comes to the, to the part of sharing. We, we need a goal. We need a purpose. We need a complete com uh, we need to continue to challenge, our, challenge ourselves to get out into the community and share the gospel. So he's saying, that was my goal. That was my goal in sharing, to be out there, to be talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, to make sure that that's what I'm doing. And because Jesus was his model, he could do that. And then finally, he talks about uh, there is joy in resting. And there's so much uh, in chapter 4, and when we get to chapter 4, as a matter of fact, let me go back to chapter 4. I'm, I'm in such a hurry to get there, but I'll take longer to get there than you think. Uh, in, in, in chapter 4, verse 10 through 12, he says, How I praise the Lord that you are, are concerned about me again, and I know you have always been concerned for me, but you don't know, uh, but, but you didn't have the chance to help me not that I, not that I ever in not, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or with little. You know, it's easy for us to picture Paul imprisoned and kind of down and in, in need of in need of something, isn't it? I mean the suffering saint. That's what we look for. Uh, but one of the greatest verses in this book comes in thirteen when he says, For I can do I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength. And it's hard for us to see him in the penthouse, but I guess there had been times when, when he shared in the riches of what the world has because he talks about it. And so when he talks about resting, he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember, he had trouble probably with his eyesight, but he's telling them, I'm writing with my own hand. Probably just the greeting, because with him was Luke and Timothy and other people that would have done that for him. But at the end, he wants to sign it himself. He wants to make sure that it has his autograph on it so they know it came from him. And he says, I write with my own hand, remember my chains. Grace be with you. And then again from the remedy paraphrase, it says, May the graciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ fill your hearts and minds and permeate your entire being. 
Amen. See, God wants us to understand how much He loves us. And, uh, and if, if we're going to understand that, if we're going to understand the joy in resting, we just need to know that, uh, that God wants to give His peace to us. And His peace comes from joy. If you're joyful, you will automatically have God's peace. You know, I hear people say, gosh, if, if I was richer, <laughs> I'd, I'd do a better job for God. If, if I was more handsome or more beautiful, I, I could do more. If my circumstances weren't what they are, yeah, I could really serve God. If, you know, if, if I had more talent, if I had, you know, I often think about that. I find myself, I catch myself every once in a while thinking, golly, I wish I could sing. And you know, at one point I could sing. I was in the third grade. <laughs> and they gave me the lead role, and I was going to get up and sing in the third grade. And I was so excited. And I was in, the little play was called Tammy. And my song was, Whipper will, whipper will you and I know, Tammy, Tammy. The old hootie how hootie hoots to the dove. Tammy, Tammy, Tammy's in love. And just before I did that, in front of all the kids in the school, I figured out I was Tammy. <laughs> and Tammy was a girl. <laughs> I was told that teacher, Mrs. Griffith, I said, I'm not doing that. And I turned down my first singing role because they had cast me as a girl. And they kept telling me, your voice is perfect for it. No, I'm not doing a girl. I got standards. I'm in the third grade. I'm 10. We're not going that direction. And then I didn't sing. Didn't sing. From then on, just did sports. If I had a son, I could sing. And I often sit here and think, golly, if I had just kept singing, like through junior high, got in some sort of stupid glee club, been in the choir at some church during my high school years, you know, if I had gotten used to it, I could sing today. And I could focus on that. But here's the great joy. Other people can sing. I don't need to be a singer. God didn't call me to do that. That was the reason for the whole Tammy thing. I did what I wanted to do the way I wanted to do it. I made my choice, and I'm okay with that. Which leads me to the thing that I want to tell you. Joy is a choice. You have the choice to embrace the fact that Jesus said, I came that you might have my joy. That you might have it. Might have it means you get to choose. Might have it means that's your decision. And it's a, it's a decision that you make. And you, you live with the attitude that you choose. And you can choose not to have the attitude of joy, or you can make the decision, God, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to believe you today. I'm anxious to hear more about the joy of the Lord. But I'm going to believe that you want me to have your joy. Without knowing Christ as your personal Savior, if you've never accepted Jesus, you will never know joy. And if God is calling you, as Billy Graham would say, I'm going to ask you to do something that I've seen thousands of people do throughout the world, and I'm going to ask you to come forward and accept Jesus into your heart. That's a choice. That's a choice. And the, the actual choice that we've been given through the gospel is the choice that we can be saved. It's a choice that we can inherit the joy that Jesus has, the smile that he brought from heaven, the smile that crossed his face when he entered back into heaven, the smile that was about him when he was resurrected and when he is resurrected again. The Jesus that I know is not coming again with a frown on his face. He's coming with a smile, and I'm guessing heavy laughter. <laughs> And that's what he wants from his people today. Those of us who know him need to express his joy. It can no longer be the gigantic secret that we carry around. It needs to be expressed. We need to laugh more, love more. Just accept the fact that God gave you joy. 
Everything emanates from joy. Grace emanates from there. The joy of the Lord, the right attitude, the right spirit, the right purpose. If you're going to live right, if you're going to...